Welcome everybody to Radicalize Truth Survives. My name is Heidi Sigmund Kuda, and we are on episode 81. We are dedicating it to Bad Faith, a new documentary about the rise of Christian nationalism based on the excellent book Shadow Network by the author and investigative reporter Ann Nelson. Today, we're going to be bringing in the film's key researcher, Brent Allpress, a good friend of RadPods. We're gonna be talking about the misuse of data and the dark money that is pushing people toward extremism. Let's go ahead and watch Bad Faith's trailer. Everything can be reduced to right and wrong. Make no mistake about it. We are talking about Christianizing America. That which God has given us, we will allow no one to take away. The Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade. We will make America great again. It's time for us people to come out of the churches! Christian nationalism uses religion to justify all kinds of evil. Christian nationalism has been a political tool for centuries. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It's about power and politics. The goal is to enshrine Christian identity as the law of the land. To reclaim the United States for God. You can't take over society unless you take over the seven pillars. And they've gone one by one to do it. We want total war. We are the Christian Taliban. We need to force the people to believe what we believe. When government is in the hands of godly men, it is good. But in the hands of all others, it is evil. Brent Allpress, we are so grateful to have you back with us today. Um, very, very grateful to you for many, many reasons. And just to start, I know that part of my job in 2024 is to not be outraged. I've seen Bad Faith now multiple times. Um, like I mentioned, I saw it at the world premiere in Palm Springs at the film festival, and I've watched it again subsequently. And now just seeing that trailer, it is very difficult to not have a visceral reaction to this plot to take what was essentially, you know, historically a relatively non-political group, a relatively empathetic group, and turn them into weapons of democratic destruction. And as the key researcher on this film, who played a big part in uh, the information, along with Ann Nelson, whose Shadow Network uh, this film is largely based on, can you tell us um, just your discovery along the way, uh, you know, how you basically, you know, came to make this kind of part of your life's work to reveal uh, what's been going on with this very coordinated attack on democracy. Uh, it's very good to be back um, with you both and with your audience. Um, I, I, um, this this movie follows uh, a, another film that I was the key researcher on called um, People You May Know um, by Kat Gillan and, and Charles Creel. And um, and uh, that, fo- that 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 do- that early documentary focused on um, my research into um, glue and Cambridge Analytica putting together a marketing platform exploiting mental health data for Facebook ads. But the um, part of that process, um, I went looking for the next secret meeting of a secret organization, as, as you do. And um, and um, they weren't an organization I was particularly familiar with, but I, I brought to my attention in the process of making that documentary. And um, uh, and I sort of got their dinner menus. And... Um, uh, then I kept that gave me I said basically member level access to the Council for National Policy, right. and they're the they're the core group who have brought together a coalition of basically oil money, extractive industry money, 
but a big farmer. Uh, the the hard right of the Republican Party, which is now the Republic Republican Party more or less, but mm. over over the period since nineteen eighty one, um, the 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 project has been to push that party further to the right um, until it, in my view, until it falls off the cliff, and yes. you know, and let's see what happens at the next election. But um, they're, they're, <laughs> they're pushing themselves off the cliff at this point. The um, the uh, uh, and uh, also uh, the moral majority at that point formed around Jerry Falwell as a sort of front person um, was brought into that coalition. Um, and there, again, think about this is nineteen eighty one. So uh, there were um, there was money generally um, as a sort of uh, mix with activism yes. on the far right and um, donors and doers as they describe themselves. So they'll hold these meetings and organize agendas and start campaigns. And then over a period again of since 1981, a series of front organizations were formed. Uh, some of them were they already existed as legacy organizations. You know, they, they might present themselves as think tanks or um, and there's most a lot of those have a have an overtly um, religious focus now, um, and it's <clears throat> again it's a sort of far right of uh, initially um, evangelical groupings. Um, they're extremists, and uh, the best way of describing them is dominionists. Yes, or as the film describes them as Christian nationalists. Um, both both fit. Um, the yes. um, uh, and the so the uh, the the extremist um, far right characterization of the of the cluster um, is unified around I would I would argue unfortunately unified around white national uh, white nationalism and yes. um, white supremacism yes so so that sits underneath ideologically. Uh, ultimately, it's uh, funded by all money in the service of the carbon economy. That's as the decades have rolled on, pressure from say eighty six onwards um, to introduce uh, campaigns of climate denial and um, and science denial. Um, there's been a lot of kind of pushback uh, on that sort of level with. Uh, uh, Coke brothers particularly being a driver of that. They're not part of the CMP directly, but they they have um, um, proxies involved <laughs> in the organisation. Um, the and lots of connections. So the the there is a kind of ecosystem or a, like a kind of economy sitting in behind this. Um, what you see in the media are conservative, so nominally notionally conservative they're extremist groups yes um and they so members of the council for national policy have their own groups so those sort of senior executives each have a group or belong to a group or a cluster and and the media it frustrates me the media focuses on those front groups and doesn't focus on the fact that almost all these people are, are part of one one coordinating organization and they run coordinated campaigns of disinformation um of psyops and and more recently have been exploiting mental health data to push their agendas and that is Which really what's key and it's for our viewers to understand when Brent talks about these types of front groups, he's talking about the groups like Moms for Liberty, which are cynical plots to move people, move a block of women suburban voters to the right. And this is the type of thing that they do. And as Brent says, uh, the media is mostly focused on the front groups and not on the machine behind it. Brent, before we go any further, um, I would like to show a clip from you in the film. Let's listen to this. What this network of organizations has done has for years uh, involved data mining of church directories, which are then cross-referenced with voter files. Pastors have been organized to facilitate this. Council for National Policy has a series of very deep ties to adjacent organizations. Glue from 2015 through was developing something that became known as the Glue Insights micro-targeting platform. 
that's a platform that accesses and harvests data on all Americans. They've actively harvested data from churches, and most troublingly, they have accessed self-revealed mental health and behavioural health and treatment data, and they're using that for micro-targeted Facebook advertising to harvest very vulnerable individuals, and then they had a very high uptake of conversions and radicalizations entering into those large evangelical churches. At the beginning there, you heard Ann Nelson, whose book Shadow Networks uh, featured in there. Brent also has worked extensively with Ann um, uh, deploying his research. And Brent, what can you tell people uh, that sort of gets them to understand the scope of this based on what you just taught us? Uh, well, the, um, the the people involved in what's effectively a, an ongoing coup, that they have mental health data on all adult Americans, which is extraordinarily dangerous. And they're deploying that for a range of um, um, campaigns, influence campaigns. Um, they're seeking to depress the left young people so they don't vote, so just uh, sort of make them um, disengaged, um, uh, feel hopeless. So the whole concern of all these sort of um, partisan polemics and evacuate the centre, polarise the yes. population, um, They'll use anything they used COVID. They'll they're using um, school boards. They've used a, a range of different um, um, trigger issues, um, and um, at the mo so unfortunately, this film, Bad Faith, um, which has been uh, running you know long and over the over a couple of years of. Um, research and and development and interviewing and all that process it's just gotten more and more topical yes you know um it initially was responding to the lead up to january 6th but it was pretty clear um that this was yeah you know that was a that was a first run um we've effectively been in the in the um in being, well america is being impacted by a judicial coup i would describe it as now that's had a long lead up of stacking the Supreme Court with um, um, individuals who are vetted or aligned with the Council for National Policy, um, and um, the um, I think the, the the big mistake they made after Jan January sixth was failed. Yes. But that was that was a oh, lot of lead into that over a period of at least a year and a half. Um, Trump was positioned as being a kind of instrument of God to try and sell him to the evangelical voters. Um, clearly, he's not godly, but um, you know <laughs> it could be useful. To bring on the end times, you know, you can see it's not such a stretch, really. Um, <laughs> <look. laughs> Sorry, uh, you know, they just—I'm just still reeling from the new, you know, uh, Trump is God, Trump ordained by God, you know. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, trying, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I just, you know, Ann Nelson made me watch that ad. Thankfully, I responded into, uh, you know, to it in a recent uh, report that I just did, actually a report that came out today. But she called it heretical. And it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, man. Is the is the jig not up yet? Yes, they have all the money. And yes, this is so coordinated. And yes, they have, you know, all the networks and the tentacles. But one area where you always gave me hope is that there have been crimes committed. And there are things that are illegal in what they're doing. And it's not just what's legal, like data mining, which apparently we still don't have enough, you know, laws against. But it's like there are things that are occurring that are criminal. Can you remind people that they may have the money, but they're also, you know, doing what the autocrats always do, which is hiding corruption? 
Yeah, well, I think um, the the controversy with Clarence Thomas receiving effectively what appear to be alleged bribes. Um, uh, his wife, Ginny Thomas, I spent quite a bit of time researching um, the relationship between Ginny's work with Council for National Policy and um, and the kind of long-term relationship that Clarence Thomas has with the CNP. And um, uh, and I, I contributed to that more uh, to the New York Times um, um, magazine front page article. So there's a sort of that stuff. Um, there's currently uh, investigations uh, ongoing through the through the Senate Judicial Committee on the um, the um, the Supreme Court justices. I think there's. I wouldn't lose hope at all actually i think things are coming to a head mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of um um there's a number of uh investigations and and indictments that are kind of closing in on key protagonists like trump um i doubt he'll survive um as a viable candidate, uh, I think that um, you know, I think timing may be tight. He might get chosen by the um, Republican Party, but I think he'll be a bit of a lame duck if he can only campaign by, um, you know, phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, he's, if he's allowed I'm to sure. have, have this, <laughs> I don't know I'm... how from allow people to have access to a phone, but you know that's. <laughs> uh... Hi-Fi has seen the film, so I know he has questions. I want to just make one comment before Hi-Fi jumps in. Um, I don't think it is uh, an accident by the superb propagandist that Trump is or whoever's scripting his propaganda that he's linking himself to Al Capone and Sammy the Bull. And he seems to be basically kind of like, you know, grooming his base for what is to come, which is the, the clarity of his mob connection. So I think well, that's all by design. But he, like he might, he might because of the the wheels of justice turn slowly. Um, so you know he he could survive through um, campaigning and 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 um, so if he's facing those sorts of um, um, current investigations, he has to position himself somehow. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's ironic that you know they probably do have a tax fraud eventually. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly uh I mean, so it's not that again that's not such a stretch yeah. i mean it's sort of it's where we started we're just a little bit closer to the target well, i mean you're in australia which our audience yeah. knows um and australia in the 80s turned down trump's uh bid to build a casino in sydney because they said no you have mob ties you can't come here and you know america you know, all these years later is still like, huh, you know, and again, this goes back to the film Bad Faith. There are many people who have uh, been, uh, you know, targeted in their thinking that this man, this imperfect vessel is delivering God's will. And this film goes a long way to show the setup and the cynical, cynical scheme to deliver that high fidelity. So when you talk in the film about people who are self-reporting drug problems, mental health issues, and then they are targeted for recruitment and radicalization, um, and, and I don't know for sure that that happened to this guy, but I'd like to tell you about a guy named Alan. And mm -hmm. Alan lived out in uh, Oregon. And Alan was a blue collar guy. Uh, he was a, you know, he was a roughneck. He was a driller. He, he did manual labor for a living. Not a bad guy. Um, he got hurt. He started doing uh, recreational drugs. He had a methamphetamine problem. And he, uh, he wanted to get cleaned up. And one of the things he did to get cleaned up is he started going to church, right? And uh, the church he was in 
very right wing radical. And one of the things Alan posted in 2020 was uh, this image on uh, mm. Parler, which, as we know, Parler was funded by Rebecca Mercer. Yeah. Um, that image right there has the Christian nationalism theme, given the fact that the knight is holding a shield of the Knights Templar. Yeah. And Alan became a member of the Proud Boys. Uh, even though they deny he was a member, he hung out with the Proud Boys. And eventually what happened to Alan is Alan is now in prison because Alan on the streets of Portland did this. Oh, dear. And it seems to me that a person with a drug problem goes into a religious institution, gets radicalized, ends up pulling a gun on fellow Americans over their political differences. Um, doesn't that seem kind of like a case that could be from this data set? There are, there are plenty of case studies that you could draw on where you could probably forensically go back and look at a point at which someone was radicalized and and that's um in a different sense to the to the podcast title but the um the, but there is a process of radicalization that's at work so the Mercer's funded Cambridge Analytica Cambridge Analytica at Cambridge Analytica part were funded to partner with glue what they've done is set up weapons grade um psyops um radicalization programs they, they they wrap them around churches as small groups for counselling. Um, they they have a range of um, partners uh, in the recovery economy, um, Christian twelve steps, but they are they are uh, radicalisation programs. Now you're dealing with people who already have mental health data, mental health issues, so they're they're very um, suggestible and um, malleable. So that's the key thing, I think. There was a high, very high proportion of people involved in January 6th who had a history of mental health issues. Um, the most famous one was, you know, Mr. The the guy with the with the hat. Oh, the, the, the QAnon shaman, right? Yeah. And, and Ash, also the QAnon shaman, yeah. Ashley Babbitt. They played to her vulnerability. She had, you know, she had... Uh, she was a completely different person before she went down those rabbit holes. And yeah, um, and I've, I, I have had a little bit of a look at that her biography recently. But they, they, so um, glue target people with PTSD. So they go after veterans. They partly do that through um, crew military. So that's Campus Crusade for Price, Campus Crusade for Christ, just dropping everything mostly and just keeping the crusade a bit. Um, but they shorten it to crew. So um they 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 have a program where they um they look to um for where pe veterans land in terms of the, the communities they go back to and the churches that they might attend or they might be encouraged to attend through counselling. So there's a there's a process at work at the moment where um a lot of the hard work of um, making contact and funneling people into these small groups and different programs is being done sort of centrally now, so it's scalable. And um, uh, churches who sign up for it get prospects coming through via, um, you know, people who are prompted from having watched a video or seen a Facebook advert. And then they have enough data that they can basically link that prospect, that person, the explorer, through to a nominated local church who's already a partner of Glue and already part of the ecosystem and has the capacity yeah. to take on board these people and they have these programs already in place. So the, the number of churches is in the tens of thousands. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, across the US. They're not all um, evangelical or Protestant. There's... Yeah. Um, 
uh there's issues with um, baptist i mean yeah yeah and 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 uh very conservative catholic yeah uh, churches i mean there's a been a bit of a battle um pope francis has um just um cut off the pension and the um and the vatican apartment for one of the key protagonists right uh, the retired american right. cardinals there is a kind of there's a faction you know this this isn't necessarily denominationally focused it's ideologically focused yes. um if you if and going back to your point about her, her, the heretical nature of the um of the claims mm -hmm. around trump Christian nationalism is an abuse of um, people's beliefs. Uh, if you already believe in something and you have mental health issues, then you, you again, you're all, all the more amenable to being having those beliefs exploited to push you towards something that you kind of, that might sound sort of on the face of it to be something you already are affiliated with, but actually it's not. So um, the... The, the the radicalization and the the shift to extremism um I think plays out at different strata so at the very far right there's a kinetic end to it which um uh is a I think a public safety and national security issue particularly with members of the military um uh veterans who may have gone through trauma and those sorts of things um the um again there was a disproportionate number of veterans in Gen 6. Yes. So that wasn't an accident because there were organizations like Veterans in Defense of Liberty, which is a Council for National Policy affiliated group. And they're organized in battalions of veterans around the country. Um, and they received so I tracked that group. Um they received a um invitation to the wild protest on January the first of 2021 just five days four days before five days before jan 6 uh, using the exact wording of the um uh stop the steel wild protest site that um to take the steps of the capital so clear incitement um so the um the the live again the level of coordination between so i we talk about conspiracies or conspiracy theorists and and there's there's conspiracy and then there's coordin co <laughs> coordinated corrupt conspiracy is very different to conspiracy theory so QAnon is just like a Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole um labyrinth for people who you know want to chase down issues basically anyone who's highly conscientious and neurotic that's the, on the ocean scale. They'll go down the QAnon hole. Um, and, you know, that could net run from um, IT people to, to um, sorry, um, Josh, but um, <laughs> IT people to to yoga mums to, to, um, to, to um, just, you know, um, people suffering from paranoia and anxiety. Um there's there's a um there's a uh you don't so one of the key things with getting people to vote in a particular way is that you want to for some of them to push them but they don't have to go all the way over to you know away from what they would self-identify as right so i think a lot of people who would consider themselves to be um Conventional Christians, if you know, main main mainline Christians, that they that if that they've that grouping has been pushed to the right, sort of similar process to the Republican Party. Um, but you, what you need is this sort of little percentage in swing states. You don't need massive numbers. So, really, the, you have to remember what this is about. This is about putting in place a regime that will uh, sustain the carbon economy and um, obstruct the uptake of renewables that's from my perspective Occam's razor it's the simplest explanation with the least assumptions um there's a um why where's the all money where's the money coming from for all of this um so you know you're talking about uh, organizations and groups that are heavily funded from from the oil industry 
and um, and from other related extractive industries. Um, religion is a means to an end. Yes. There are absolutely some uh, not so happy clappers who are um, uh, <laughs> they're they're true believers in um, their own righteous uh, right or well, their their own right to uh, to 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 inst- uh, to to um, found a, effectively a sort of Gilead state. Um, they're cynical though. I because I've had the access to the back end of the propaganda they share and the kind of meetings they have. It's very, very transactional. So there will be, and there are some hardcore believers in a kind of Christian nationalism uh, who are in leadership positions, but most of the people I've seen are extraordinarily cynical. They're all on the take. They're all getting huge amounts of... um, of money out of this whole thing, um, they're ga- they're looking to gain power. Uh, one of the things, so when I when I was looking at the Council for National Policy uh, meetings over the last few few years, because I had access, have access to, you know, over a decade's worth of um, of their activities, um, the um, um, Dennis Felder, who's the head of of um, of uh, sort of the key um, um, anti-abortion group, um, lots of money. Um, that she she was um, she's a senior member of the Council for National Policy, and she was sort of arguing for the effectiveness of the um, get out the vote uh, impact of the anti-abortion campaigning that they were doing and funding. Um, this is at the midterms when they didn't do so well, but. She was arguing that in key areas where they'd put a lot of resources and they got some, you know, so, so and that was really clearly a kind of um, trigger, trigger um, issue to try and motivate people who don't have to vote legally, who don't probably, you know, the proportion of Americans who don't vote, it's shocking. Um, it's compulsory in Australia. Yeah. Uh, doesn't necessarily give you better government. So it depends on what people vote for. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, but <laughs> voting is... At the very least, a good place to start. Yes. And so if you want representative government, then, you know, it's quite good to actually vote and be represented. So um, so getting people who are often quite complacent to engage, well, one way to engage them is to radicalise them mm. um, and, uh, and extremist stuff that provokes them. Uh, and so they used to use, and I say used to, this is the thing, they used to use abortion as a get out of the vote trigger very effective um they overshot with the supreme court yeah with that early decision after jan 6 um to uh, overturn roe versus wade which they said they wouldn't do uh, and that's left them uh in a precarious position i would argue um in the um and for ha- well it's for over half the population, but for half the population. So women voters across um, ideological and um, and uh, religious and party lines, um, there was a consensus around Roe versus Wade. There was a consensus around the uh, right to privacy, which is effectively what that's about. And um, ev- every election they've had since, they've, they've hit that wall. And every time it's come up at a you know, really kind of um, red state level. I think it was Kentucky was the, you know, they, they got they got, um, they, they got got a bit of a wake-up call there that there wasn't the support for, um, for, um, for changing um, the, the state laws to ban abortion. So um, I believe that um, they've, um, it's, you know, they've sort of, if they gained power, or gained enough power to, to pull that pull that lever and overturn Roe versus Wade, what they've done is uh, motivated a very large portion of the population who may not always vote. 
We, yeah. We've absolutely seen that. We've seen it in Ohio multiple times and yeah. uh, from Kansas to Ohio in the last year, we've actually seen that. And we've also, the 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 media, I, I say just, it's, you know, lumping them all together is unfair. On the other hand, I don't know how else to do it when the metrics for Trump have been trending downward since 2018. His candidates that he backs have been losing. He has yeah, been the biggest loser uh, you know, when you look at the metrics and yet there's still this sort of belief that he's bigger than he is. And we interviewed somebody who um, voted for Trump twice, described it like being in a cult and is now forming a group called Leaving MAGA. And he said that people are quietly exiting this MAGA, what he calls cult, uh, not publicly necessarily announcing it, but that there's more and more. And I would love to know based on what we learned in bad faith and what many of our viewers will learn once they are able to see this film, yeah. what can we best do to sort of mobilize and harness the rebuke that is occurring across the country uh, based on what you just described, this rebuke to taking away women's rights, this clarity of what we really are facing in 2024 and also this absolute rebuke of Trumpism? Well, I think um, conversations, you know, it takes conversations at a local level. Um, I mean, individuals need to make, you know, clear choices. But um, I think there's, a, if you look at any family, this stuff could impact any of them. Um so there's already been a um, one tragic case recently where someone's died um, that, you know, that the, the level of, of medical risk, uh, the, the loss of, well, you know, there's all this talk of liberty in these far right groups. You know, it's a liberty for who? Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like um, religious, you know, re religious discrimination bills is a, is a, a bill to allow um the religious to discriminate against people that don't like <laughs> as opposed to to um um to um so I th I think there's people have to be very are they I mean look there's a self-interest as well as a kind of communal care and interest yeah that that should it should be a wake up call um and Roe versus Wade is, I think, a key trigger. Look, one of the other things, if 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 young people, there's a couple of things they care about. One of them is the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, they care about that. The other ones are going to have to face it and deal with it. All that mess that the boomers have left. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> No I, just, no, I just love it because you, you have a way of just like simplifying, you, you know, you explain it and then all of a sudden there's the zinger. It's like, yeah, boomers Look, are left I, in this. I'm, and... I, I'm Gen X, but my family, my siblings are all boomers because I'm the youngest by a long way. So I understand that, you know, I, I come from a sort of the, you know, I'm very aware of the, the kind of, um, you know, that sort of, again, it's a freedom to... <laughs> <laughs> Freedom for who? Um, so the the um, but the the um, the other thing that's really significant in that week, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, three days later they overturned the regulation regulatory authority the EPA had for yes. uh, regulating the environment and for yes. air quality and 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 their their ability to therefore regulate carbon emissions. Yeah, and so that was the real goal of that week. Yeah. So, yeah. And there was so much noise from Roe versus Wade. Who talked about the EPA losing the regular the regulatory authority to um to um to be able to kind of um uh have any kind of impact on on carbon emissions? Right. So that's that. So this is it. you see, you have a weaponization of a of a um of a um uh, ideologically driven um imposition of will and force on half the population um around um you know, super conservative gender um um patriarchy effectively um with a kind of um radicalized and extremist sort of religious bias and then whoop 
right under the door goes the um the um uh, another another means to kind of um uh have some kind of constructive impact on uh the environmental destruction that's occurring through through carbon emissions thank so, you for bringing it thank you for always bringing it back to that because that really is the core and one of the great things that you taught me is so much of this is cover for the fossil fuel industry's interests and their long-term goals so, and yes yeah. i mean I, I think you have to look at the cmp as being a coalition of convenience so mm -hmm. um the far-right religious groupings were brought on board they could bring a group of voters people who had to generally didn't vote yeah you know bring them on board to vote you activate them to vote. Yeah. Um, but they need those get out the vote triggers. So they've, they've taken abortion off the table now. And if they talk about federalizing bans on abortion, that's just going to amplify the anger and amplify the, um, the, the kind of impact. So I would expect that becomes a sort of point of contention over the next few months, whether there's any talk about a federalization of abortion. Um, because I think that will be a um uh a, if you want to get out the vote that'll 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 get the average person to sort of just look carefully i think i agree uh, uh, i only have two more things i need from you brent but i want hi-fi to jump in if there's anything on your mind there's something huge on my mind um but as for abortion i mean you can you can see that the right is already attempting to walk that back uh trump's recent comments on women's rights and abortion and federalization of abortion he's he's pulling back from that right but yeah they're in trouble here's oh yeah they're, they're totally in trouble but one of the things i do as a technologist um is when i hear about something bad like when i watched um it's currently available on youtube uh people you may know has been uh renamed into data and disinformation yeah uh investigating cambridge analytica so you can go watch that on youtube right um but when i watched that movie and i heard about glue and the fact that they were uh using self-reported medical data to target people i thought that's crazy so i looked into glue and what i found was this and yeah, yeah, their board of directors and primary funder was a man I worked for. I was actually under Pat Gelsinger at VMware. And then after I started making that information known about Pat and Glue to a bunch of my former coworkers and people who still worked there, um, he left the company. But then what happened was shortly after he left, the SEC charged VMware with misleading investors, right? And now, yeah. if you look for Pat Gelsinger, you find him sitting as the CEO of Intel. Yeah. This is terrifying to me. Intel is one of the largest chip makers in America. And this man is in charge. Should people be worried yeah of course you should um but it's also um a sign of their arrogance and hubris they think they can get away with this because they won't um oh, I, but, I love that i love that they're, they're not going to get they're that. not going to get they're not going to get away with this say say it one more time brent <laughs> they're not getting away with it um so pat gelsinger had a history with intel and then he became the c so he was I think he was um, um, COO at one point or something. He had it, so whatever the role was. Then he became CEO of VMware, and then he then he shifted to. So he sort of did that MBA loop. You move, you know. Um, he's managed to get now. They the the um, they had to report his chair role of glue to the SEC. So. Um, uh, you know, there's a bit of a problem there for them. Um, the but it's not just it's it's not just Pat Gelsinger. I mean, he's a key he's a key figure 
in um, trying to evangelize Silicon Valley, so the kind of Bay Area, you know, um, I guess well, no, I've, I've not... sat across the t I have sat at his right hand at a conference room table and yeah. and, and I liked the guy. I, right I honestly yeah. liked the guy yeah. until such time as I found out about all this. And one thing that stuck with me is he said, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? He, he said mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, and, and the problem with that is, and I didn't say it at the time, perhaps I should have, what about the people who don't have any boats? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the that's the Titanic, isn't it? You know, but I, but but you bring up such an amazing point because I've been looking at somebody, and and I I think that there are many of these characters when you talk about somebody who's trying to move Silicon Valley, evangelize Silicon Valley. I look at somebody like Linda Yaccarino, whose job is to reputation wash and whitewash the clear you know, fascism that you see on Twitter X all day long. And it's like, there just seems to be these people put in positions of power that do not seem to, um, you know, or or whose roles to me uh, seem to uh, kind of cover up for, again, much more of a cynical plot as bad faith reveals somebody like Linda Yaccarino for me is just so incredibly dangerous because as you see Trump turning uh Twitter X into 4chan and celebrating the absolute um you know uh disgusting nature or some of these very destructive memes that are used as weapons there you have the CEO just saying nothing to see here everything's good we're all fine and it's not it's like our our it's 2024 the house is on fire we all need to be aware of what's really going on and i just feel like the reason it's so important to bring you in front of our viewers is anyone who watches can see much more clearly what's actually underneath so much of the headlines which again focuses on the cover and not the the very dangerous roots underneath that need to be pulled out yeah, the other thing to realize as well is that there are these coordinated campaigns. They're multi-channel. They go through social media. They go through the right-wing media. They go through Murdoch papers, particularly, um, and um, Fox, obviously. And um, and they're they they're, they're very carefully coordinated campaigns. And so it can feel like there's some sort of consensus of a view of some event that's occurring or there's some kind of saturation but actually that's that's the, that's the means by which the stuff is, is is sort of you know the the you try, want to try and push public opinion you just saturate w with with a particular position so um i think anytime you see something uh coming up in the media that has a certain cluster of protagonists pushing it then you know you put a flag on it stick it in the go okay that's one of those that's one of those things that's great yes <laughs> and, and that's I, go ahead i, I need to I, I need to talk about this because this really bothers me um in 2016 i actually did not vote right i i did not vote for either candidate the reason i did not vote for hillary clinton was because i was caught up in the seth rich psychological operation and, and you know, in retrospect, that. it almost feels like it was target. I'm a I technology guy. I did not know that. that I did not know that. That was a technology guy, right? He, he was an yeah. email administrator. Um, sure. His death made, you know, kind of freaked me out about Hillary Clinton. Um, but here's what's weird is in 2020, when I was going after QAnon and, uh, you know, the anti QAnon side, I was I was messing with both sides. Um, what I found out was I was pushed towards an individual as being involved who was not involved, but it turned out he was involved in, in the Seth Rich conspiracy because he had to testify in court about pushing mm -hmm. the lies around Seth. Yeah. And it's just it's it's one of those operations. And there's any given day, you can see 
tens, if not hundreds of these operations mm -hmm. running around the country. And you have to wonder like, where is our national security apparatus? Why is this, why is this fake reality? Why is this cognitive warfare allowed mm. to be pushed on our population? Just yeah, I think that there's, a, there's a sort of, um, uh, I think the media need to change their focus and role. And um, around the time of the 2020 election, they uh, began to put qualifiers on statements from the president and eventually, you know, he, um, so that there was the um, Brent Bazell from the Council for National Policy was commissioned to do a big study of why they lost. And they're quite happy to say that, that he lost it just internally. And he was interviewed by Bill Walton on his, um, on his um, podcast. And again, another senior CMP person. And they, um, they, you know, they said Twitter was a plus in 2016, uh, was a negative in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they pointed to that um, qualification, you know, the sort of the, oh. the, um, you know, the sort of um, uh, the, 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 the framing of extremist statements or false statements um, as wow. being one of the key things that, that uh, woke up voters to to um, the issues at hand um, and the coordinated nature of the kind of influence campaigns and just sheer lying. You know, you say you lie is enough, people can't start to believe it. It's how gaslighting works. So, so having that, um, you know, disclaimers or qualifying kind of framings or um, in some cases, um, you know, Trump was deplatformed, um, that so they they were arguing they needed to take over social media. Now, Elon Musk, um, in his role with Twitter or ex Twitter, um, would appear to be one of those mechanisms for um, uh, um, replatforming the far right and setting up. Twitter particularly is a disinformation platform for the 2024 election. Um, there's no, I mean, there's no economic basis for anything that's occurring in Twitter because it's bleeding with the lack of advertisers. So, you know, but, and. Well, it's um, lost 71% of its value. Yeah, I mean, the man yeah. is burning money. Not if you look at Linda Yaccarino's threads, everything's fine. Do not yeah. believe your eyes and your ears. The party. Well, if if, if, if Twitter, Twitter is still, a, it's got a substantial population and, you know, um, it can still be deployed for influence operations. Yes. Facebook was the primary means by which the mental health data was deployed. And Facebook's still there. The mental health data is still there. So that hasn't gone away. Um the um, if we if, if there are actions taken prior to twenty twenty four election that are able to kind of resolve some of those issues, there will be other outlets, other pipelines will reform. So I think what has to happen is that the the economy that allows this stuff to occur in the first place needs to be tackled head on. So how data gets exploited. Now, generally, so much data out there, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. But you can hold, you can, you can, you can be vigilant about certain categories of data or certain means by which, say, a, a data broker might acquire a um, a company that specializes in anonymizing data for medical studies. Yeah. So then you've got, you know, you, you get these two companies, one is anonymized data they're acquired by a company that has every bit of data they need to to de-anonymize so glue themselves have set themselves up as a, um, a data exchange platform now so they're kind of enabling that process and scaling it up so so i think there's 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 behind all of this there's a there's work to be done to dismantle some of that economy and um and um, data brokers are a key part of it. Um, 
at a at a everyday you know when you're being impacted by um by disinformation um i think you know there's there's a there's a practice i suppose of of um you know critical consumption that has to be encouraged the latest which is closer to my disciplinary background and urban stuff is the attacks on the 15 minute city which is you know walkable walkable cities you know where all the things you need are just like around the corner yeah. therefore you, and also your job might be around the corner and you know you don't have to get in your car and commute for an hour and a half so that's less petrol so that's the problem so let's go after that so let's turn that into surveillance processes everyone's going to get locked into their cities you know and the, and it's just like lockdown again just like covid so that's the latest um that's the latest uh, crazy conspiracy. Interestingly, I tracked um, where the epicenters for it were um, in the last, because it's a recent one, sort of last eighteen months. And the Netherlands was a key epicenter for the for the anti fifteen minute city stuff. And that does at, not surprise me. And you look at, at what all. happened in the in the um, so Oxford was the sort of was the actual town of Oxford was was one key. Um, local instance where there was a coordinated campaign against a 15-minute city. Wow. Uh, proposal. Because of what they do, they do traffic calming. You know, they try and um, uh, increase public transport and you put in facilities that are closer to where people live. You know, it's all good, healthy stuff. It's like food miles. Can't, but, can't have any of that good, healthy stuff. Uh, Brent, what always really um, is so, I'm so grateful because you always make us zoom out and say, who benefits, who is sending the messaging, put a pin in it, put a flag in it, you'll know exactly what it is. And it really helps educate our viewers. And um, before we let you go, I just want to say that I am revisiting the 2016 election interference. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because when Donald Trump and J.D. Vance and Elon Musk and Alex Jones and uh, who am I missing, Charlie Kirk, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, Tucker Carlson, when they all start coordinating their talking points, uh, backing uh, somebody like Douglas Mackey, who played mm -hmm. Ricky Vaughn on Twitter, who had the most influential account, more influential than, you know, NBC and uh, Drudge Report uh, in just a mere few months. And that person has a seven month sentence now for interfering with the 2016 election by using, by pushing uh, vote from home, text your vote for Hillary, and thousands yeah. of people called that line. But for me, it's not that the cover-up's worse than the crime, it's that the cover-up points to the much larger crime. So I think it's very important that people start hearing things differently. When you have this particular group of people who we know to be propagandists, who we know to be delivering Russian propaganda, for example, it's not what they're saying, it's what they could be covering up. And that is the lens that I'm taking heading into 2024 to help inform my work. And is there anything you can say to Americans and really anyone who has a democracy on the ballot this year for 2024 to help them sort of refine their thinking? Because it's going to be, you know, a, a year of tons and tons of staged horror events and obfuscation from truth and Give us one of those great Brent simple, you know, framings to help people. Watch a couple of documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's simple, isn't it? Just, yeah, just, just bring it back. Look, I've got something to sell here. So, <laughs> no, 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 it really is that. No, it's simple. true though. No, so it's go back and watch true. people you may know. So, yes. so that's that's that's. So if you want to hunt for it, go people you may know. Creel K R I E L on yes. YouTube, and it's there for free. And then so, also disinformed, uh, um, anything by Charles Creel and Kat yeah. Gellin, disinformed also has another name, but Dis bad faith. Dis disinformed is a great one for the, the you know, the, the QAnon yoga mums. Um, yes. The Bad Faith is an important film. Now, I, I've collaborated with, with Anne from part, because we met during the making of the previous documentary. Yeah. I contributed to the um, the updated Revised edition post January sixth of her book, um, Shadow Network. Shadow Network, yeah. So they should that um, so the paperback of Shadow Network. That's a good one to pick up. 
Yeah. Um, uh, from Anne, uh, she's the um, she's the authoritative. She gives the authoritative account analysis of that material, and she was having to do that when most of it was kind of uh, COVID. I've um, um, I've you know been I've waded through the the um, the operations of these people now for four or five years. Um, I think I understand how they work. Um, the but then having that laid bare, and I think the bad faith does a really great job of of giving a coherent narrative, very clear narrative of how this stuff is playing out and how these things, how how religion and belief are abused and exploited, how um the, how um the the role of the church historically to provide social support has been weaponized. It was basically furious. Think about yes. sort of people in the Salvation Army and the kind of great role that churches have played as a kind of um uh, extra social cohesion and support, and also bringing people together and uh, to form community, yeah. sort of sincere faith and and belief. That being exploited for the most venal ends, um, you know, just the most exploitative. It's it's a, it's it's an extractive economy. The population is being being subjected to an extractive economy. The other thing that I think Joshua pointed to um, was around. Now, it's not a surprise that Glue is a technology company. You know, the Cambridge Analytica worked with a technology company, and then they had a whole bunch of people who are tech, big tech from from um, you know from San Francisco, have in Silicon Valley uh, have closely aligned with this. It's not limited to the right. It's not limited to Christianity. It's also potentially there in the mindfulness app space. If you're on an app that begins with H <laughs> and you do mindfulness for grief, mindfulness for anxiety, mindfulness for depression, don't do that one. Pick the other one. The one begins with C. <laughs> <laughs> don't do, don't, I, I, well, I would... Well, I want to I do an experiment this. now. I want to do an experiment now when I do, and I'm going to try that. I'm going to do some some grief mindfulness on that app and see if I get contacted because that would um, be well, interesting. Look, there are there are there are um, um, board and investor relationships between Glue and Headspace. Yeah. So that's just the uh, back. It, 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 it was a little scary when I found, you know, it was free during COVID all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden it's free during COVID. And then I saw through the work that you did, the link between those two. And I see people in real time who are using these apps, who've gone from being progressives to uh, extremists in their beliefs. And so this is, this is a five alarm fire, but it's absolutely curable. And just so everybody knows the film is Bad Faith. You can find yeah. out more about the film at badfaithdocumentary.com. It's very important that um, uh, you, con you contact the producers. You're going to be able to do screenings uh, in your communities uh, by contacting the producers at badfaithdocumentary.com. It's also yeah. really important that the film ends with Reverend Barber from the poor people's campaign basically saying that we need to be focusing on love and unity and yeah. he he reminds people of the true message of christianity and i'm hoping that those who've been radicalized away from their true core are able to actually have the courage to see this film have the courage to actually listen to what brent is trying to tell you uh and know that you have uh, been targeted. You, as a Christian, of somebody of faith, may have been targeted, and that there is hope to come back to who you really are, which is a loving person, an empathetic person. Qualities that have been weaponized to move people into a political base very cynically. We can bring all these people back, and that's what I'd like to see. That's Look, my wish. It's it's empathy. 
it's it's um it's kindness that's the sort of Jacinda Ardern yes position but kindness is a useful one because you can even weaponize love and empathy if you you know if you if you're in the wrong group right kindness um... is, kindness is a really helpful one so um so is this a um is this a um uh, again the sort of who benefits or or who who who's at most risk you know what can can you help um often it's a matter of um providing support to those around you who who may be struggling so that they don't turn to unhelpful um and exploitative sources of support um so there's 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 that sort of basic ethos community and family and and faith group ethos that i think is still needs to be reaffirmed um there's battles to be done but there's also um healing to be had and um um i think um for a lot of people there have been under a lot of stress not everyone has to be engaged in battle. You should get angry about things that, you know, are wrong and let that motivate you, but but for good reasons. So um, things like loss of privacy, um, the kind of um, uh, um, attacks on, well, I said gynophobic, misogynist attacks on women's rights, the, the the rolling back of civil rights from the 1960s those gains that's really the the key agenda here is mm -hmm. is to kind of roll so all the school board stuff is basically mm -hmm. resegregation by stealth is the is the ultimate kind of they're trying to push people into private schools and you know and then and, that's, and profiting at the same time which people yeah, don't know yeah, 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 all that stuff so there's 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 a kind of also um it, part of the counterculture from the 60s was anti-establishment and a sort of, um, you know, a kind of reasonable paranoia about government, particularly under Nixon. But, you know, mistake, <laughs> mistakes were made. I mean, the Vietnam War wasn't started by Nixon. Yeah. You know, the, the mistakes were made. Right. So, so um, but I, this idea that government should be ideal and perfect that's not going to happen. You know, I think what you want to do is look for pragmatic governance and um, and transparency um, and look much more closely at people's actual track records, what they've actually done. You know, the noisiest people in Congress have, you know, contributed nothing to legislation. Um, so there's a kind of, there's all sorts of ways in which you can kind of, begin to um, unpack and unravel the kind of disinformation. So I think I think going forward, yeah, I, the, we, we, there's a normal government relatively in, in America at the moment. Uh, and, and I say normal in the sense that the, the Congress is a dog's breakfast, but, you know, um, <laughs> but, but it's fair, like they're on a wafer thin minority. So yeah. Yeah, they've they've got so this is why this is why bad faith is a documentary. Everybody has to watch it just yes. to understand the next five months of having a speaker who's a dominionist and a yes. Christian, yes. who was who was one of the key protagonists in the January sixth yep. through through legislation through sorry through through court cases. Um, that guy, that that sort of Mister Clean, is uh, you know a, a, a mask. Yeah, and. Um, He's up to his eyeballs. He's presented at the CMP. He he um, hides behind a mask of civility, bringing civility back. Um, but you have to look at the um, the 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 other track record that he has. Um, his wife's involved in conversion therapy. There's a kind of context for this that would make most people recoil if they really looked a little more closely. Um, the um, the the again again I think I think um, 
Just vote. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's bring it on. Bloody, Let's bring it on. Vote. Voting would be yeah. good. Yeah. If you're no. young, if you're younger, and you go, oh, you know, it's all a conspiracy. They're all as bad as each other. Rubbish. Yeah. yeah. You know, anyone, any, any of these populist socialist psyops campaigns that said, you know, um, uh, oh, the corporate Democrats, you can't vote for them. They're yeah. just you know, part of the military industrial complex. Yeah. Well, any anyone who doesn't vote for a mainstream democratically focused government is allowing the the fall of America uh, through the the through a um, effectively a coup to put in place a um, an authoritarian regime who will just rip the um, rip the environment and rip through the social network of the sta- of the states. We all have a stake in that in every other country because of the scale of the states and because there are cookie-cutter franchises of that sort of regime popping up all over the place. Argentina is the latest one. Yeah. Australia was subjected to one for way too long. And that, interestingly, I mean, that's sort of pro- possibly where the Republicans are going. Australia had a government that became um, increasingly far-right and evangelical, um, we had a um, prime minister who decided he would embody the seven mountains. He managed to get the prime ministership plus five secret ministries that he appointed for himself without telling the actual ministers of those departments that he was also the minister and could just <laughs> override them at any point. So um, uh, so th- they've been reduced to an unelectable rump and they've lost their heartland seats. Hey. And... and there was a um, a kind of third party of of uh, uh, conservation minded conservatives, professionals, women candidates um, who who replaced all of the dinosaurs. So I would I'd be looking at um, you know um, it's probably quite interesting. I I I think Republican parties can't survive. It hasn't survived. No, it, it it is no longer whatever it was. Um, it's not representative of a mainstream position. If you're a if you're a conservative who who who's into into you know small you know um, small business and all that sort of stuff and you know free markets, well you know that 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 bus lost its wheels a long time ago. And the thing that's the thing that's <laughs> now barreling forward um, is a pretty scary, scary um, behemoth. So, oh, uh, you know, uh, Jason Stanley taught us that you know, big business that backs fascism or small businesses that back fascism don't realize that eventually they come for everybody. They'll come for their business too if their cronies want it. Um, Brent, I feel always so much better after I speak with you because this is always so daunting, but then you bring us down to kind of brass tacks. And I think where I would just like to end this is on that note of healing, on that note of empathy, on that note of unity. And seeing that, for example, your country rebuked this extremist uh, far right party. We've already rebuked the extremist far right party, and we need to continue doing it. We can get the house back. We can actually have a functional government. We have to actually vote. <laughs> Let's remind people we must vote, but we can do this. And it's focusing on, um, you know, just just uh, g- getting back down to basics. Yeah, and then, look, this um, going back to you know good sources of of information to counter disinformation so people you may know um bad faith um St- steve Uchlaki and um and um chris jones are the directors of that film and i think they've done a fantastic job i think it's a really great platform for for Anne to just very very clearly lay out that kind of recent history of how this stuff is playing out. Yeah. Also, it does offer some great role models for the role of the church in the community. The actual, yes. the actual kind of ethos of 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 you know the, I mean, how many of these? How many? <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount doesn't get much of a run with Christian nationalism, does it? No. 
no. <laughs> you know, so there's so um, there's it's not an issue of Christianity; it's an issue of an exploitation, and 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 I think it is heretical, um, and I think it that heretical exploitation of belief is a psyop; it's a influence campaign. It is aimed at corrupting people's um, sense of community. Um, the other one coming out is This Is America, which is another documentary I'm I'm involved in, and that's going to come out a little bit later this year right. with um, with um, Rocky Romano and um, and um, um, Winter's Rock of the other production. So you know, there's going to be a series of 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 you know we just keep getting just out keep, there and try. Just I think keep doing it. Well, I, I think make so when things are really, really complex, then being able to explain that clearly without reducing its complexity is one of the tasks. So I'm an educator. I'm a, you know, that's so that's it's that's kind of my reason for being in a way. So you don't try and reduce things down to false, false kind of oppositions or simplicities. It is complicated. <laughs> Yeah, but that 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 those complications can be explained and situated. There is a conspiracy. People should feel a bit paranoid. There <laughs> are conspiracies. There are real ones. Forget about <laughs> made up ones with the tin tin <laughs> the tin foil hat. There's real ones. They've been going for a long time, you know. And they're they're criminal ones. They know. Yeah. So that, that that's the so yeah. You should. It's just a matter of. Um, uh, just being a little bit. I mean, I love blocking Twitter adverts. I love it. I just, you know, it's great. <laughs> yeah, there you block it. That's never going to see me again. I love doing that. I do that every day. Now you can't do that on Facebook, but just you know, they're feeding you stuff. Just ask yourself, you know, why did I suddenly get X, which actually does interest me, and then what's this other thing that's right next to it that I didn't think about before, which. Why are they sending that alongside it? Just it's all you got to do. You know, so that's the it's those adjacencies in the algorithms that they'll kind of help kind of carry you down the down the rabbit hole. So um there's an like people are exhausted. COVID was yeah. COVID was terrible. Um the world we're in our post-COVID is a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. You know, the economy's still kind of all over the shop um things some things seem better but they don't feel better you know it's it's the way people work and live has changed so i think um the dangerous part of that is that those lockdowns put people in a digital space yeah and that that's carried on you yeah. know glue expanded massively with barnet during that uh, lockdown they were come became a service organization for online the online church economy. So, so you know, you've got to be. I think we we're buying online far more than we used to. You know, people aren't going to shops anymore. So, some of our behaviour has changed. So, I think we just have to be vigilant consumers, vigilant citizens, vigilant members of the community. Um, um, treat everybody as family and see how see see if that helps. <laughs>